for me, you can take all the tests that you want, these biological evaluatory tests, you truly only as young as your immune system. If you have a strong, robust immune system, you're gonna be biologically younger than your chronological age. Immunity is the key to longevity. In that, a new study from Tuss and Boris and you really answered the question, and they found out that you had a functionally resilient immune system. Speaking about immune resilience, that's the key to resisting disease and living longer. It's a groundbreaking research study introducing that concept of immune resilience. It's a term representing the ability to withstand and bounce back from infections and inflammatory stressors. So the longevity of centurions was really reflected by the gut microbiome. Essentially, they found good, healthy species that really correlated your chronological versus biological age, really in your 40s or 50s when you were 90 or 100. So again, I believe the gut is the epicenter of your health. Time Magazine said the secret killer in 2004, literally 20 years ago, was inflammation. And as I said before, inflammation is the backbone of a lot of our conditions, or especially our chronic conditions. In the interim, in the last 20 years, high inflammation has now been related to the concept of inflammaging, inflammation that ages you from the inside out. So again, I like to manage and modulate inflammation to really quell the concept of inflammaging. So here are some of my longevity hacks. Number one, let food be medicine, let medicine be your food. Nothing more profound was ever said when it came to the basic concept of food, because good food is a potentiator for health information. Bad food is a potentiator for inflammation, so obviously choose wisely. You want to dramatically reduce your added sugar, your starch, and your ultra-processed food intake. Exercise, as we said before, muscle mass is the longevity. Organ muscle, the fat, is the next step up the ladder of longevity. When you exercise, you really want to incorporate resistance training. Sleep, sleep is a, without question a rejuvenative hack. Health detectables, I'm wearing an aura ring, I've wore continuous glucose monitoring. I believe in detectables being a backbone for many different types of ways and checks on people so they can stay on their health path. Meditate, I'm a type A personality, you know, I always have a joke with Simon, come join and meditate with me. We would look like two, um, two seals trying to do a, um, a special kind of, uh, dance pose. Intermittent fasting. I am a big proponent of intermittent fasting. Maybe one time we can do a seminar on intermittent fasting, but especially intermittent fasting and the differences between men and women and how to be effective to allow intermittent fasting to promote health benefits for females. So they can be, they have issues with their adaptability to the time window. Obviously low level laser, it is the device of the 21st century. Laser's versatility has allowed me to attenuate a myriad of symptomologies and conditions. Purpose, mission, and community. I mean, I get up every morning and I'm excited about being in this great community where we're giving the most valuable assets to our patients, our friends, our family every day, which is health, because I do believe that health is wealth. Hormesis, let's make a strong definition on hormesis. It's the body's response to slight stress. Hot and cold exposure is a great option of hormesis. Low level laser is not hormesis. Supplements, and of course, you want to test her and keep an intact gut barrier and you want to remove any food sensitivities. I believe the most effective clinical outcomes across all disease spectrums can result from the normalization of gut function therefore increasing your longevity, your lifespan, your health span, and your vitality. So for me, the concept of N01, everybody asks me, what's the frequency? What's this? What's that? It's the phase of the injury. Is it a male? Is it a female? How old is that person? What injury did it occur? What health are they? It's the N01. It's the data points. 
So you really want to individualize your approach to allow clinical outcomes to be optimized. The immune system provides three levels of defense against disease-causing organisms. The first one is the barrier system. It's your skin, it's your mucous membrane. It has been postulated that the first time the outside world meets the inside world is when something goes in your mouth and passes through your small intestine. Your second line of defense is your innate immune system. It's a general defense. It's white blood cells, neutrophils, macrophages. They engulf and destroy foreign invaders and damage cells. Number three, your acquired, your adaptive, your specific defense immunity. They're B and T cells. T cells come from your thymus. Your thymus gland is interesting in that it's the first gland to go through involution. And your, your T cells are critical at, recommend, at recognizing, pardon, your foreign parasites, pathogens from entering the body. White blood cells called B cells come from bone marrow. They produce antibodies which memorize and characterize and catalog injuries to the body or attacks to the body. You've seen this slide before if you've seen any of my presentations. Basically, I mean, I could go through each point. But the bottom line is the gut is the epicenter of your health. If you have failing gut health or you have damage to the gut, you also have damage to the liver, which is still bidirectional to the GI tract. If you have a gut problem, you're going to have an insulin, blood sugar problems, prediabetes, and diabetes. Also, obesity has been linked to leaky gut. Leaky gut leads you down a slippery slope of autoimmunity, hence the idea of thyroid. Gut to brain, brain to gut. Gut on fire means brain on fire. Brain on fire means gut on fire. Happy gut, happy brain. They are without question. That tie is the super highway to health. One of the major communicators between the gut and the brain and the brain and the gut is your vagus nerve. And lastly, musculoskeletal injuries also. An increase in cytokines occur when leaky gut is present. That leads you down a path of arthritis and joint pain. The release or the excessive release of MMPS is matrix metalloproteinases. They divide its own proteolytic enzymes with each soft tissue injury or i.e. fibrocartilage like disc. So there's a gut to joint, there's a gut to disc axis as well. Here's food sensitivities. As you can see, these antigens get through, they pass the gut lining, and they stimulate an immune response. So food sensitivities are one of the main reasons for hidden chronic inflammation. So some triggers of increased gut permeability. Number one, antibiotics. They are nuclear weapons, everybody. Without question, they're going to lead you down a path of increased intestinal permeability. More so than that, acid blocking drugs, PPIs, proton pump inhibitors, they should be taken for four to six weeks. They're typically taken for four to six years, and some people even take them for decades walking in my office. NSAIDs, non steroid anti inflammatories, NSAIDs do decrease pain, they impair healing. Nutraceuticals and laser decrease pain and promote healing. Which do you prefer, Mr. and Mrs. Patient? There's heavy metal exposure, there's environmental toxins, there's concussions. 60% of people that have a concussion have a leaky gut or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Cesarean birth also leads to increased gut permeability, liver toxicity, gut dysbiosis, and of course, food sensitivities. Candida, which is a yeast overgrowth, there's all the, so that's CFO. There's a bacterial overgrowth called SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, all can lead to leaky gut, chronic stress, sleep deprivation, chronic inflammation, alcohol, gluten, dairy, sugar, artificial sweeteners, and one of the more egregious sets would be food additives and emulsifiers. So I do a lot of gut barrier testing. Anybody who's interested, I'm, help, I'm happy to help you uh, understand these tests. Just for a brief overview, this shows two different antibodies, IgA, which is initial at the mucosal lining, IgG, which means that you have um, antibodies released over duration of time, and you have something called C3D, which comes from the innate immune system, which is stimulated from antibodies. So if you produce too many antibodies, you're still susceptible to produce inflammation. And the most stable inflammatory molecule in the body is C3D. 
So in this, in this study, this individual has candida for a period of time, small intestinal fungal overgrowth, yeast overgrowth, because it's depicting a positive in IgA and IgG. Sonulin, which is a protein enzyme that pulls apart tight junctions. It's the only reversible part of a tight junction or intestinal permeability. So it can go up and it can go down. The structure is still tight as, as long as only zonulin is effective. When occludin is positive, which it is not in this instance, that means there's structural damage. LPS, again, one of those topics that we, we could spend a lot of time on. There'll be some upcoming laser case studies done with LPS, LPS lipopolysaccharide, leads you down a path of increased injury to structures, organs. As a matter of fact, the expression of LPS has indicated that there's a three times incidence of heart disease. So candida inflammation and an imbalance of fungi in the gut could contribute to excessive inflammation in people with severe COVID-19. Zonulin, it's a protein synthesized in intestinal liver cells key biomarker for intestinal permeability. It is, again, the only reversible regulator for intestinal permeability. Elevated levels of zonulin are associated with a lot of different things, celiac, autoimmune, inflammatory bowel, blood dysregulation, rheumatoid arthritis, and even obesity. Higher levels of serum zonulin may rather be associated with increased risk of obesity, hyperlipidemia, also higher waist circumference, diastolic blood pressure, fasting glucose, and the increased risk of male bowel disease. Sonulin is a basic longevity marker, one that everybody should try and utilize to see your status for health span, vitality, and lifespan. Occluding, essentially occluding is the structure forming the tight junction. It's a barrier to regulate transport. Occluding is open, typically or damaged in response to zonulin. Elevated levels are associated with the progression of intestinal permeability. Again, we talked about LPS before. I'm going to give you a little bit more background. It's a major outer and surface membrane components present in almost all gram-negative bacteria. Many of the gram-negative bacteria are pathogenic, approximately 80%. LPS acts as an extremely strong stimulator of innate immunity in humans. It's an endotoxin. It can release a large number of inflammatory cytokines. It's directly related to damage or epithelial damage in the gut. LPS can cross the fame blood-brain barrier. LPS also acts as a bridge between the gut microbiota and immunity because as we know, that thin single-layer epithelial cell that's known, which actually has the thickness of a wet paper towel, which is known as your gut barrier, bridges the inside of the body or the outside world and the inside of the body. If LPS is inside the gut, interleukin-10, which is an anti-inflammatory interleukin, and also conversely shuts off all pro-inflammatory interleukins, life is grand. However, when the gut barrier is compromised, and LPS goes outside the gut barrier, interleukin 10 is shut off, so anti-inflammation is decreased, and all these pro-inflammatory interleukins like interleukin 1 beta, interleukin 6, interleukin 8, TNF alpha are elevated, you're in an inflammatory state. LPS attaches to something called toll-like receptor. The huge takeaway from here is it stimulates NF-kappa B. NF-kappa B releases inflammatory cytokines and interleukins. The expression from LPS attaching to toll-like receptor also damages the mitochondria and also sends a seg second signal of inflammation to stimulate the NLRP3 inflammasome. So essentially, LPS attaching to toll-like receptor 4 stimulates two inflammatory pathways, NF-kappa B and NLRP3 inflammasome, while also damaging the mitochondria and also stimulating toll-like receptor 2, which is your atherosclerosis placking pathway. So that's how LPS increases the incidence of heart disease. This is a slide that I look at every day, and every time I look at it, I seem to learn more and more about the process. 
Systemic LPS is linked to multiple disorders like heart, joint, thyroid, metabolic disorders, lung, brain, liver, and immune modulation. So it's sort of demo time. I'm going to give you the information and then get to demo. I wanted to leave some time for conversation with everybody. Whoops. So photobiomimics, I wrote an article on it. Uh, Vanessa, your uh, maitre d', if you will, your host, has got a copy. Simon, Kate, and the whole team has a copy. I wrote an article on photobiomimics, explaining how it has the ability to alter the microbiome. Inherent in the word photobiomimics, photons affect the microbiome. So much so that laser light affects the microbiome indirectly through the daily circadian rhythm. So let's take a second and really talk about that. Applying laser to one's gut, and I use my direct, my Dr. Rob's master gut protocol. Everybody should write this down. Four, four, nine, 26 can positively affect the gut and sync the individual with their circadian rhythm. If you're in tune with your circadian rhythm, you're in homostasis with your environment. You know, Simon always knows that when I come out there, I have to come a day early because my circadian rhythm, you guys are five or six hours ahead of where I am in the Eastern um, Standard Time Zone from New York. And going forward in time, is really hard in your microbiome and your circadian rhythm. Going back in time, when I go home, it's fabulous. The circadian clock regulates levels of metabolites, including those from the microbiome, which in turn can affect the metabolome. Disrupted circadian rhythm on the microbiome shows that bacteria is responsible for decreased gut integrity and increased LPS can occur. So lasering is preventing leaky gut in my opinion, and also preventing the expression of LPS. There was a favorable improvement in the gut bacteria once lasered 400 fold. Incidentally, the violet light, which you can find readily in a handheld called the EVRL, Aconia Violet Red Laser, is a great choice, and the FX405. They were seen in this study in 2019, a significant difference in microbiota diversity between laser and sham. And that sham is LED, that's all those hot lasers, which are very deleterious to one's overall health. There's no reason for me to utilize any of them. I'm a big believer in non-thermal laser, which leads to electromagnetic transfer of energy. So the violet light, once again, really has a great effect in inhibiting biofilm formation and killing a lot of bacteria. Biofilm formation, what's a biofilm? It's a bacteria igloo. It's like clack in your teeth, it's sticky, it's protective, it's gummy. Biofilms have been shown, or at least stated by the NIH, to be present in 80% of bacterial infections in your gut. So within that, if you don't have a way of breaking up the biofilm, you're never gonna reach solid gut outcomes. The moment that I started to use biofilm busters and add low level laser, especially the violet light, the violet light, because it exerts a direct antimicrobial activity on different bacteria, was when I started to really elevate in my outcomes with my gut protocols. This slide speaks to the idea that 405 enhanced antimicrobial activities for photo disinfection of biofilms. Identified the 405 nanometer as a specific wavelength with increased anterior and antibacterial activities. EVRL FX405. So here's um here's a little bit of a protocol for you. Here is the FX405. You could have the 635, and there you see the application of gut protocol. Remember, if you have a handheld, it's 44926. If you've got a 635, it's 44926926. If you have an FX405, it's 44926. 
44926. Now, I'm going to shut, I am going to shut, I'm actually going to turn on my, I cannot see my camera. So I want to show you, I'm going to turn this around. Just load it up. Hello, everybody. Here's a little trick. You can put this in your 635. And there you go. So I put the 635 in here deliberately. So you're not going to be able to see the violet on me. Yeah, there it is, because I'm wearing a, a poor color for it. But the violet and the red are illuminating. It's just me in here today. So hopefully everybody can see. Vanessa, let me know if you cannot see. I've just added the 405 to the 635 and stacked. I think you can move the camera down, like angle it down slightly. How's that? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I so can see. So you're standing up just on the gut area. So you could do the um, 635, you could do the 405, but you could also stack. So a lot of people have bought a 635 and now have a 405. So it's simple. This is what we call stacking. One plus one. If you just have the EVRL, this is how you would laser the gut. Every patient walking in should get a gut laser application. Now, before I go any further, are there any questions on that or any questions on any of the material that we've covered so far? If anyone has any questions, please put them in the question box. Okay, we can continue for now. Oh, hang on. How long would you recommend to laser the gut for? Minimum of five minutes. I will give you this. I think that people are lasering for too long a period of time. I think that a lot of the studies that were done, we weren't sure. So we made sure, you know, like for instance, the EDRL study was 13 minutes, but it was 13 points, one minute a point. If it was, if we weren't doing those points and we were just doing a general area, it would probably be a little less time. The lower back studies on the FX were 20 minutes. We now know we don't really need more than 10 minutes, which should make you feel good because you have um, a, just a faster patient outcome. And stick to the uh, stick to the protocols and for the frequencies that I give you. These are tried and true. And again, my suggestion is don't get locked in the frequency adhere to the concept of the wavelength. Remember, there are two wavelengths that we're utilizing to date, 405, which has different properties. It's typically more immune-based. It's more sympathetic-based. It's uh, very skin-based. And the red, which is more wound healing. You combine the two, you're not taking away any product properties, you're adding them together. So that's why in a handheld to date, I would recommend the EVRL and in an FX 635 out of 405. So if there's again any questions, please put them in. I allotted time in my presentation for questions. Um, how soon after laser in the gut do you see an improvement? Well, always the caveat. Um, Everybody's going to be different. Some people immediately, some people take 10, 12 visits. I usually see an average in about four visits, but I have seen instances where it's just one visit. It depends. Do you have, you know, does that patient have ulcerative colitis, you know, um, Crohn's disease where there's damage to the structure, or are we talking about somebody that may have a little dysbiosis? I laser every patient's gut that comes in my office 
nutrition, chiropractic or not. Okay, great. I think we can continue. Well, how about the gut to brain reconnection? So you guys will be learning about the GVL in the future. So for right now, you can use the EVRL. All diodes on the FX in this picture are pointed at my head. It's 1, 5, 10, 20, 40, 60. So there's a few master gut protocols out there. These are the six frequencies that you can pick from. 1, 5, 10, 20, 40, 60. One, the ones that are more popular are 1 and 40. 40 is quite popular because it's the exact hertz to help stop amyloid and tau tangle placking. And one is very popular because it's a real good choice for delta waves to help people get sleep in any kind of acute injuries. 1, 5, 10, 20, 40, 60 for Master God of the FX405. Any vagus nerve, I call it the perfect 10. It's 10, 10, 10. And you don't see it here, but I've got two FXs. I have one on my brain, one on my gut, and one I'm lasering the vagus nerve. So if you don't have three lasers and you only have two, you can simply laser the gut and the brain at the same time. If you've got one big laser and one handheld laser, you can laser the brain and or laser the gut and laser the vagus nerve. If you have one handheld laser, you have to do them all individually. Um, just a quick one, Rob. Um, mm -hmm. If somebody has the green laser, so let's say the emerald, can they use that in addition to the EVRL if they don't have the GVL yet? I would do that and stack it. So I don't have an emerald here. So, hi again. So everybody saw that I just put it in and it stayed there. Again, if you have an emerald and this doesn't fit like that, all you need to do is wrap it around and you can stack the laser, the EVRL with the GVL, uh, excuse me, with the emerald. So to answer your question, yes. Yeah, because it's still the green, green laser. Right. We good? Yep. Uh, quickly, would you suggest a binder when laser in the guy on the on the previous slide? Say that again. I'm sorry. Would you suggest a binder when lasering? Yeah, I use a lot. You're you're talking like a Z binder, or you're talking at a gut, a biofilm, a buster binder. Yes, of course. Laser therapy is outstanding on its own. It's a standalone. It's a standalone therapy slash device. But it works very synergistically with medical and chiropractic tools. So absolutely, anything to get the patient better. But remember, you're adding a binder and the laser. You should be able to open up that biofilm. Okay, great. Thanks. Low-level laser application is shown to be great in pre-diabetics. It increases magnesium and vitamin D expression, but it's also shown to reduce apoptotic factors and increase glutathione levels in different pain models. Glutathione, which is your master antioxidant in the body, glutathione decreases as we age. The decrease in glutathione increases the incidence of leaky gut. So obviously another reason to add low-level laser therapy application to one's gut protocol. BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factors. BDNF is a protein enzyme that comes from the gut that goes to the brain that stimulates brain neurogenesis. Now, there's two studies on, uh, showing that the application of low-level laser increases BDNF. So conclusion one, benefits of low-level laser to the brain is mediated by stimulation of BDNF production which may in turn encourage synaptogenesis. Low-level laser may have applications for neurodegenerative conditions. That study, uh, the second study, suggests upregulation of BDNF with low-level laser ameliorates amyloid beta-induced neuron loss. So you're really seeing some excellent choices for laser. Yes, I think lasering the brain is a great choice. 
but I think lasering the gut or at least the gut first may be the best choice. BDNF shows promise as a treatment strategies for neurodegenerative disease. It has been shown that lower levels of BDNF are present in Parkinson's disease. Brain BDNF expression is reduced in people with Alzheimer's and production and transport of BDNF is altered in Huntington's disease. So let's really talk about the gut to brain connection, getting to the root cause of a broken brain. So I'm a big believer, you probably just heard me say, gut on fire means brain on fire. Brain on fire means gut on fire. Happy gut, happy brain, happy brain, happy gut. You get this production of inflammatory cytokines, which actually cross the blood brain barrier. They activate the brain microglials. Microglials are the macrophages of the central nervous system. They eat cellular debris. You have two types of micro, uh, microglials, M1 and M2. M1 is a pro-inflammatory microglial. M2 is an anti-inflammatory microglial. M1 is much more pertinent or present and popular in females. Women have a tendency not to be able to flick the switch from the pro-inflammatory microglials to the anti-inflammatory microglials. One of the reasons that they're more commonly getting neurodegenerative diseases and having um, worse and slower outcomes for concussions. You then lead to brain inflammatory neurodegeneration. You now stimulate the brain to gut axis to an inflammatory neurodegenerative, and you've got the enteric nervous system getting involved when you have your gut. Your gut, here's my argument. Your gut has its own nervous system. It's called the enteric nervous system. It's the largest nervous system in the body. And your gut also can communicate with your brain, which is part of your central nervous system. So I believe the bullseye, again, is your gut and your brain is one A, 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 if you will. So neurological dysfunctions in the gut to brain axis, just from simply gut dysbiosis, which we know if we apply the laser, changes the bacterial environment of the ecosystem 400 times. So you're really never gonna have gut dysbiosis if you apply the laser appropriately. You're gonna decrease your incidence of depression, anxiety, bipolar. So you see a great change in mental health, autism. A lot of studies coming down the pike on their corneal lasers and autism. Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, which are neurodegenerative disease. There are also autoimmune diseases. Dementia goes with Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, epilepsy, even ALS. So let's take a look at stress, adverse effect on the, on the gut barrier, gut microbiota composition, toxic chemicals, medications, inflammatory cytokines, undigested food molecules, lectins and agglutins, which are direct binders, food colorings and gums, all damage the intestinal barrier and causes intestinal barrier dysfunction. They lead to food allergies, intolerances, and food sensitivities, that which leads to immune system abnormalities, ultimately autoimmunity. And that autoimmunity really influences the blood-brain barrier and leads you down a path of neural autoimmunity. Anything that passes that cherished blood-brain barrier has brain material and brain matter to focus on. No questions about that gut to brain axis, how you're gonna fix the brain performance via the pathway of the gut. Um, just a quick question on a protocol. If somebody is quite large, so i.e. quite a lot of surface area to cover, would you still only do five minutes laser in the gut? Yes, because it's all about absorption and the lasers, the corneal lasers are about absorption. It's not about the depth of penetration. It's about the quality of absorption. Anything else after that one? No, no, all good with that. So this slide really talks about the gut microbiome and the release of the gut microbiome of amyloids. Amyloid placking is always implicated in Alzheimer's. Amyloids are produced and released into through the GI barrier into the bloodstream because of the expression of LPS. 
LPS also damages the blood-brain barrier, which allows the amyloids to parse and pierce the blood-brain barrier, get into the brain and stimulate central nervous system amyloid placking, therefore leading you into inflammatory neurodegeneration, central nervous system inflammation, and ultimately neuroimmune disruption. The gut microbiota dysbiosis, we talked about that before, is very common in Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease, again, is bi-directional, gut to brain, brain to gut. We also know that alpha-synculin, which is in, implicated in Parkinson's, can take a ride from the gut to the brain by the vagus nerve when vagus nerve tone is not balanced. ALS, and I have some really good ALS protocols. When you guys come to see me in June, I will be showing you these protocols. These are real involved. They need to be seen over a duration of time. It's just a, one quick thing where you can ask for the frequency and think that's it. So ALS is probably the toughest out of the neurodegenerative diseases because as that third bullet states, six month probiotic treatment influence gut microbiota composition. You don't start to see an improvement for six months. And in ALS, that six months is like a lifetime to allow that disease to cause more damage. Brain facts, don't use hot lasers. Again, a lot of people from the UK asking me about different lasers and hot lasers, LEDs. Don't use a hot laser. Your brain is only 2% of your human mass. It weighs about 2.9 pounds but yet it utilizes 25% of your body's total glucose utilization. It also has 20 to 25% of oxygen consumption of the body. Most cerebral processes are sensitive to temperature fluctuations. These temperature fluctuations modulate behavior changes and reflexively generate the autonomic response. Hypothermia is shown to protect against excitotoxicity. So a cold brain, is actually much more effective than a hot brain. To put something that would utilize heat to the brain, I would just basically say that's a fever. So here are some overall effects of low level laser and playing different roles in neurodegeneration. It's shown to decrease inflammation by knocking down TNF alpha, interleukin-6, interleukin-8, interleukin-1-beta. It's also shown to increase antioxidant capacity by stimulating the NRF2 pathway, preserves mitochondria by decreasing a lot of our reactive oxygen species and making the mitochondria function more effectively. It decreases plaque formation. It increases anti-apoptosis, which doesn't allow cells to die before their time, and allows for the survival in neuronal activity by increasing dopamine, serotonin, 93 to 95% of serotonin comes from the gut to the brain, and BDNF. Here's some of the molecular mechanisms of <clears throat> utilizing low-level laser therapy. You just simply laser your brain like so. <clears throat> I'm giving myself a haircut. Sure, it's in my office. I'm doing the comb over, Vanessa. You know, the infamous male comb over. I love it. I was doing the, you do the John Travolta, you know, like Saturday Night Fever. That's an old one. Yes, I saw that in the movies. I'm that old. <laughs> A quick question, Rob, while you're doing that. Um, if you have multiple lasers, do you need less time? Like, I don't know, if you were using an FX and an EVRL at the same time, do you need to do it for less time? You can do it for less time because it adds to the electromagnetic transfer of energy. But again, I don't laser for long period of times anyway. So for instance, my brain protocol with an FX is eight is uh, 10 minutes, five minutes temporal, five minutes Mohawk. Cool. So adding the laser expression to transcranially uh, to your brain increases synaptogenesis, BDNF, and neurotrophins. 
neuroprogenitor cells, decreases neuronal excitotoxicity, decreases brain edema, brain inflammation, brain death, and increases new blood vessels. So blood vessels and nerves, nerves can fire together, therefore they rewire together after laser application, and blood vessels can grow. You can get improved blood flow. There was a study done with an acconia laser that showed uh, with a functional MRI an increase in blood flow. Concussions, increased blood flow, a great choice for a better outcome. And here's your ALS. So I wanted to quickly give it to you. This is an advanced protocol. These are the type of things you're gonna see if you come see me in June, that's June 29th and June 30th. ALS, everybody, as we all remember, affects both upper and lower motor neural regions. You'll get a benefit from all three wavelengths supplied. If you only have two wavelengths, continue to utilize. So a great way would be to utilize the FX635 and the soon to be released GBL. Um, there is your frequencies, 1, 5, 10, 20, if you have a handheld, at 40 and 60 if you're using an FX635. Laser the brainstem and the primary cortex. After that, laser full spine to the brainstem, 9, 16, 33, 36. Any affected areas with ALS, 9, 16, 42, 53. Use my master gut, 449, 26. Use my master vagus nerve, 10, 10, 10, 10. So before you ask any questions, two minutes per area. So two minutes brainstem, two minutes primary cortex, two minutes full spine and brainstem, that's six. Affected muscles, how many affected muscles? Two minutes, let's say three affected muscles. 12 minutes, gut, another two minutes, 14, vagus nerve, two minutes. This is ALS, ladies and gentlemen. This is Lou Gehrig's disease. This is the real kahuna, if you will. So that's one that I wanted to share with you. But when I come, I will go into detail. I'll show you the ins and outs because there's nothing better than hands-on when it comes to laser therapy.